Amigas y amigos, buen día, buenos días, good morning. Welcome again to uh, Clinton Global Initiative Latin America, and thank you very much for being here. Let me call our four discussion leaders so that we can begin our work. Beginning with uh, Michael Berkowitz, the Managing Director of the Rockefeller Foundation. <laughs> Luis Gazer, the CEO of Siemens. <laughs> Eduardo Paez, the Mayor of Rio de Janeiro. and Susana Villarán de la Puente, the mayor of Lima. So let me begin by expressing how uh, pleased, as a Latin American, how pleased and how happy I am that uh, CGI is uh, in Latin America. This event has its uh, brief history, as some CGI old timers will recall. Several years ago, after numerous CGI events uh, in New York, CGI decided to start these regional events. And the first one they put together was in Hong Kong. The second one was to be in Latin America. And at that particular point, Senator Clinton became Secretary of State Clinton to be one of the most respected Secretary of States that the United States has ever had. And of course, one of the unintended consequences of that positive transition in her career was the fact that the U.S. government then asked the Clinton Global Initiative not to hold any events outside the United States. So we're very happy now that Senator Clinton moved to be Secretary of State Clinton, moved to be you all know what we would want that to be, that we're back on track with uh, CGI in Latin America. I'm very happy that this takes place in Brazil. It was always meant to be taking place in Brazil. This is a fantastic country. You could almost say a fantastic continent in and of itself. And of course, as with the rest of Latin America, it's gone through its transitions. But I was very pleased and happy to see that we recognized President Fernando Enrique Cardoso here this morning. Because if there is uh, one architect among several, but one primordial architect that brought Brazil back to stability and began its ascending pace and set an example for Latin America, it is definitely our good friend Fernando Enrique. So why are we all so excited to be here with uh, the Global Clinton Foundation? Some of you have been with us in New York, some others not. But let me tell you what the Clinton Global uh, Initiative is all about. This is actually a global recharging station. A global recharging station. We go out there in our daily lives, we do battle to get the objectives that we want to see accomplished. In the process of doing that, we get all beaten up, all scarred up, all bent up, because the world is a challenging place. And then all of a sudden, when you feel you're almost done and out of energy, the Clinton Global Initiative comes up over the horizon. You come in, you check in, you meet interesting people, you hear great conversations, you begin to feel the adrenaline flowing again in your body, and you go out there all ready to do battle again for another year in the world. So this is your global recharging station. Now. This plenary, revitalizing an economic transformation, critically important if we are to take on the two challenges of the world, poverty alleviation and climate change. And we're going to run this session like a marketplace. We'll have a demand, we'll have a supply, and we'll have bidders. First, we will go to the supply side with both Michael Berkowitz and Louis Gazer, who are going to tell us what they are doing with respect to these issues. And then we'll come to the demand side, to our mayors here, to see if they buy what our discussion leaders have talked about. You will be the bidders making the calls, 
and seeing where you want to take this in the relationships and the possibilities that you take out of this session, hopefully towards CGI commitments. So without further ado, let me start off with you, Michael. After 2007, more than 50% of people in the world are living in cities. Latin America is the most urbanized region of the world with 80% of the population already living in cities. So without forgetting those that are not living in cities, how do we start this off? You at Rockefeller have been at the forefront of talking about resilience in cities. What does that mean? And what is your 100 city program all about? Yeah, I, I think it's precisely this trend of the world rapidly urbanizing that uh, led Rockefeller to announce its, its commitment. I would say the other trend is that these cities uh, are because of where they're situated and because of the rapid growth that they've experienced are also impacted by uh, shocks and stresses uh, uh, more and more frequently. And so for those reasons, earlier this year, Rockefeller announced its 100 Resilient Cities uh, Centennial Challenge. Um, and it was part of our $100 million commitment uh, to create urban resilience worldwide. And what we mean by resilience is the ability of cities uh, to respond to, recover from, uh, thrive, uh, learn from in the face of uh, chronic stresses like food, water, energy shortages and acute shocks like storms, earthquakes, terrorism. And so as the president, uh, as President Clinton was saying, that's the what and the how much. Commitment to build urban resilience, hundred million dollars. Uh, but to, to the more interesting aspect of this is the how. And so our theory of change goes like this. It says, if cities are better organized uh, around this issue of resilience, if there are some organizational principles, um, they will both be better able to connect the dots internally and make more of the initiatives that they have going on right now, and they will be better able to receive all of the solutions that are out there, and we were talking backstage about how many solutions are out there, and you're gonna hear about a couple today. And so with that in mind, Rockefeller, um, uh, we announced that we would provide winning cities with four areas of support. Um, and let me just name them and then I'll talk a little bit more about them. So it's uh, uh, support to hire a chief resilience officer, uh, assistance to create a resilience strategy, access to a platform of services and resources that cities can draw down on, and um, uh, membership into a peer-to-peer -peer network. Uh, so let me start with the chief resilience officer. So we're, we're, what we'll do is we're going to fund cities to hire a chief resilience officer, a senior person in city government, mayor minus one, maybe mayor minus two level, with the breadth and scope to work across the sectors and the silos and really advocate, coordinate, and integrate all the efforts that might help a city better withstand shocks and stresses. And we're gonna support that person to create a resilient strategy, to go through um, a risk and hazard assessment, uh, to look at infrastructure, uh, the social sector, economic development plans, public health, and so on, to come to agreement uh, amongst the city holistically about what the priorities are uh, that the city needs to address to make itself more resilient in the face of, of shocks and stresses. And so that's the coordinating element of it. At the same time, we're going to develop a platform of services and resources that cities can tap into. Um, and let me get, just give you a couple of, 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 of quick examples. Um, uh, Swiss Re uh, will provide its uh, CatNet software, risk assessment software, proprietary risk assessment software free to cities. Um, the Architecture for Humanity, a, a, a nonprofit architectural group, which done, has done a lot of disaster uh, response and recovery work, and out of that work has interesting training, um, uh, uh, model building codes, resilient design center concepts, will provide those resources to cities that, as part of their process, identify that they want to improve the built environment. If you need to improve the built environment, you can tap into this resource. And, what, and the other thing we're doing is looking at innovative financing. Uh, so w both from what are the financing uh, facilities and funds available out there to help cities address 
infrastructure problems and, 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 and other issues? And why aren't cities better able to bring some of those projects to a fundable stage? What is the technical assistance that's needed um, uh, uh, to get a, a project from the idea stage to something that can be funded in terms of feasibility studies and lining up the different investors and environmental impact and so on? Uh, and so we're working with a number of partners, including the, the, the regional development banks, the World Bank, the IFC, and so on, to try to bring some of these resources to bear so that when cities identify as part of their planning process that they need to make major infrastructure improvements and need to figure out how to finance them, we can help provide that. Finally, um, we will provide access to this peer-to-peer -peer network because we know cities learn from other cities better than they learn from anyone else. And so a global network of chief resilience officers uh, is something we hope cities will, will take advantage of. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, I hope we get time to come back to your thoughts on innovative financing, because a lot of this is about mobilizing capital and seeing where we have to knock down the pins so we can mobilize more capital into this. And a lot of it is also about putting together different and new business models. So let's hope we get back to that uh, with you. Uh, Louise, let me turn to you for the other 50% uh, of the supply side of this market that we are creating here. So to begin with, congratulations to Siemens because uh, you've been in the region for over 100 years, since 1867. Uh, great, fantastic. Now, Siemens has made it a point to very much be in this smart green growth uh, new emerging global market. Uh, if you look at your company, you're all about many, many different things, all interesting. You are from a universal smart card uh, for transportation and every other service in Lisbon, all the way through building out 1,500 kilometers of DC high transmission lines for energy in China. But you're also putting together a Green Cities Index. What is all of that about? And how will that help our mayors here in terms of their decision-making process? Well, we believe that there are major challenges in the world for urbanization. And in fact, we've organized to put one of our major segments of business all focused on cities and infrastructure. As part of that, we have a great many, not only solutions that we offer, but networks of information to help share with cities. The Green Cities Index was a way where every, uh, the largest cities in the world, all around the world, were actually evaluated if they cho chose to participate on eight attributes of a green, sustainable city, whether it's transportation, water and sanitation, environmental policies, different aspects. The main goal was not just to evaluate and rank the cities, but the main goal was to be able to create a vast library of best practices to be shared among cities on how their issues can be solved by someone else's already innovative solution. On top of that, we have in London a place called The Crystal, where we demonstrate various ways that cities can solve their issues in innovative and green ways. We, every year, sell more than 40 billion euros worth of green technology. So our solutions are not just solutions to solve a problem, it's to solve a problem sustainably. And what areas can we help to solve cities' issues? Well, energy, whether it's offshore oil platform electrification or whether it's distribution of electricity in a city to reduce losses in open green spaces. Transportation, as we have transportation that allows mass transit and in fact it's used in many cities here in Latin America. And there again, the multimodal view of transportation, not simply a view of one metro line, but how do all of the trans how does the whole transportation system connect is the way we view that. In London, for example, we've reduced traffic by more than 20% and increased the speed of traffic by over 37% by simple innovative solutions. And then security and information ability. I saw your TED talk where you, t you have your control room for the city. We too provide those for different cities around the world, whether it's for 
uh, a stadium's protection, or whether it's for a, a police department in Dubai, it, it's still the idea of information and being able to share it. And also water. Uh, in Sao Paulo, we actually have a control system, an automated system for the water supply that reduces the loss of water down to 6%, where in most cities it's more than 50%. So many solutions. The issue is what, you, what do you need? Luis, thank you so much. Um, so now let's uh, turn the uh, coin over and let's go to the uh, demand side. Uh, I want to ask you mayors if you buy what's on the other side of the market here, what's on the other side of the street, if you buy their solutions. And let me turn to you first, uh, Mayor Pius. First of all, thank you, sir, for having us in this uh, fantastic city. Muchísimas gracias. Uh, delighted to be here. So you have uh, stressed the importance of ICT, and some of our discussion leaders this morning have already talked about different aspects of ICT. Now you're faced with the Olympics uh, coming up. I mean, on top of all your challenges, not to call them complications, how are you dealing with that? And what is the space that you see in all of that for public-private partnerships? A lot of business in here, a lot of business people in the room um, sure would want to invest. Uh, how do you attract them? How do you include them? Well, first, let, let me make just an uh, initial remark here, uh, because, I mean, I think it's impossible to speak about Latin America uh, without speaking uh, about the role of cities or the role of mayors. I mean, I'm not saying that because me and Susanna, we are mayors, uh, but uh, every day yeah. more, we are proud mayors. As President Clinton was a proud politician, we are proud mayors. But the point is, I mean, we are talking about the most urbanized, as you said, President Figueres, the most urbanized uh, continent in, in the world. And I mean, mayors are the ones that have the, the capability of giving answers to the everyday problems of the people. I mean, we're closer to people. So uh, local governments are the ones that are going to solve most of the problems that, I, I mean, we spoke a lot in the first sessions this morning uh, about the protests and, and people going out on the streets. And most of the answers that can be given to these people, I mean, I speak on behalf of Brazil, but they, they were asking for, I mean, obviously less corruption in politics, but they were asking for better services. And that, that has to do with mayors. I mean, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm happy that President Juma has already left because she wouldn't like to hear what I'm gonna say here, but uh, by the end of the day, I mean, when you talk about health, it's city responsibility. When you talk about education, it's city responsibility. When you talk about mobility, it's city responsibility. So mayors have a major role uh, to play. And I mean, the, the partnership with the private sector, uh, it's very important. I mean, when you have institutions like uh, Rockefeller uh, doing this program on resilient cities, because you can act in a way concerning climate change, like C40, uh, what we try to do is have more sustainable policies, have more sustainable solutions, but by the end of the day, we know that there are some problems that we already face. I mean, like, just, like, just like last week, Rio has a history of big floods. We are in a tropical country, uh, big, big uh, uh, summer storms. We just had one last week. It was a huge thing. Uh, so cities need to learn uh, how to deal uh, with this uh, different environment. And uh, partnerships with institutions like, like the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, the work that Siemens can I say something about other, other companies like IBM? I don't know, they don't, they don't like each other. Uh, gee, I mean, there's, there's a bunch of interesting uh, 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 initiatives these days uh, that can really mean a change uh, in the way we do that. Why is that so important that uh, Rockefeller Foundation does something like uh, uh, supporting uh, cities? It's because we, institutions like Rockefeller, like C40, like uh, a lot of organizations, uh, the, the problems and the solutions uh, that we find are very similar in Lima or in Rio. I mean, we face pretty much the same problems, especially when we talk about developing country cities. And building an index, uh, I mean, it's bringing the mood or the way the private sector acts. Because if you don't have an index, you cannot, you know, you cannot be accountable for. I mean, nobody's gonna go there and tell you, okay, you're not reaching uh, all your goals. So I think it's, it's very important to have clear goals 
on the work that we do. Uh, in the, other, in the other part, I mean, when we are talking about building infrastructure, we, we saw a lot of the talk here in this morning, I mean, in the first uh, meeting with President Clinton and President Yuma, we know the lack of infrastructure uh, of cities, uh, of Latin American countries, especially Latin American cities. So if we don't work with the private sector, it's going to be almost impossible for us uh, to deal with all these challenges, only with dealing with public money. So I'll give an example. We have... Uh, the largest PPP in the country. It's a PPP built by the city of Rio, by the city of Rio. Uh, it's a PPP that's completely uh, uh, renovating the port area of the city. So it's like a five million uh, square meter area right in downtown Rio. It was completely abandoned for, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 years. Uh, with a big viaduct. So we're doing a seven billion reais PPP there. So the, the, the city, I just tear down, a via, exploded a viaduct uh, that was a big one, separating downtown Rio from uh, Guanabara Bay, from the sea. Uh, we just explode that, we're building three tunnels, all of that with private money. So, I mean, with, with all the, the needs we have, with all the, the, the things we need to deliver on health, on education, if you don't have the partnership with the private sector to get the infrastructure done, it will be tough. And there are some original uh, ways that cities are dealing with uh, the private sector. So I really think that the private sector uh, is very important. On these issues, like Rockefeller Foundation does, like Siemens does, obviously uh, me and Mayor Susanna, we always want to get a discount on IBM or Siemens. They always, you know, they come, they come with the nice solutions, but this, once in a while they charge too much for that, so I cannot, uh, I hope we have some donations here. You know, they discuss things a lot, but when they come, the price is high. So I hope they come with some discounts, especially for Lima and Rio. Uh, but I think the private sector can be a great uh, partner of cities in finding solutions to our problems. Thank you, sir. So the marketplace is beginning to work. Request for discounts. Um, Mayor Villaran, uh, so thank you for being with us here this morning, Senora Alcaldesa. Uh, Lima, one-third of the population of your country in Lima, 7.5 million people, uh, quite a challenge. Uh, does what you have heard here so this it's morning... It's more than that. It's more it's than that. It's almost 10 million people, if Ten you include million. Callao, the harbor. Even Lima. bigger responsibility. So does what you have heard here this morning resonate? Are your problems and challenges so similar to those of uh, our dear Mayor Pais? And does what the market has to offer there help you with those 10 million people? Yes, absolutely yes. But I will like to move into Spanish because I express myself better in Spanish. But I can understand you quite, quite well. Uh, so I give you one minute. Yeah. Don't worry about the Brazilians because we all Brazilian speak Portuguese. people here. Okay. We all speak Portuguese. We understand everything okay. you say. Don't worry. President, friends, dear mayor, es una alegría estar en Rio. Claro que sí. Nosotros trabajamos muy cercanamente con el sector privado. De hecho, existió en la elección de la alcaldesa Susana Villarán una duda muy grande porque yo pertenezco al sector progresista y dijeron cómo es posible que esa mujer vaya a hacer avanzar la agenda de la inversión en infraestructura que está retrasada más o menos 30 años bueno casi tres años después casi tres años después con un proceso de revocatoria que afortunadamente no funcionó hemos we have multiplied in five the private investor investment in uh, fundamental aspects and infrastructure of the city so to be able to be competitive and integrated yes we bought the good practices uh, and innovative practices, but that's not enough. It's not enough the great roads that will connect 
status. Connectivity is fundamental, of course. It's fundamental to have infrastructure to gather. Lima is a hub, an airport and telecommunication hub that is fundamental in the Pacific area. And we unite the two big oceans, and that's a great advantage, a geopolitical ge uh, advantage. But we need to face, and we're doing that, initiatives and uh, with the Rockefeller Foundation. It's uh, helping us. It's a resilient city. What has to do with Barrio Mio, the uh, sides of the river and uh, Rimac River are facing similar problems. We need to be prepared for the earthquakes in face of the climate change that in Peru is dramatic due to uh, the uh, loss of ice on the, the glaciers. And we're preparing with uh, Barrio Mio that was presented in a, in a meeting uh, a short time ago in Milan uh, by our uh, manager. But in transportation also, we are creating a revolution at the present moment, and I'm calling a revolution in transport. Because not only as our dear friend, uh, the mayor from Rio, to have a, a, a subway, but the most important of our neighbors, all of our neighbors, transfer themselves in buses that contaminate, that uh, congest the cities. And the revolution includes to change all of the system, forming the integrated multimodal system between Metro, BRT, and the renovated buses. And yes, we have bought also, because that means 60,000 entrepreneurs that pass from the informality to the formal system, uh, people that generate jobs, uh, income, and good salaries that Lima had in informality is a serious problem. I hope to have more time at Manuel Soto solving these problems with us in Lima of uh, passing from uh, the informal area to the formal area, not only through the ownership, but also through the culture, a topic that uh, we didn't touch today, but it's fundamental in building cities that we need. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, señora alcaldesa. So a second request here for Hernando de Soto to spend more time back in Lima. Huh? We need him. We need him. Perfecto. No está don Hernando por ahí, no? Alguien que le lleve el mensaje. Bueno, eh, you talked about 30 years of backlog of infrastructure. Yes. You talked about multiplying by five your private sector years. investment only in three years, multiplying by five investment into private. infrastructure. Yes, private investment. And Mayor Pius talked about mayors being the front line of solutions and providing services to populations uh, in cities, which is absolutely true. So a lot of the challenges of bringing these solutions have to do precisely with financing. You talked about innovative financing at the beginning, Michael. Yeah. It's all about creating new business models. How are you going about that? And Louis, you, I would be very interested in your perspectives as well on that. How do we help cities with the financing, creating new business models as well? Yeah, I, I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a great uh, question. And just to add a, a point of emphasis, I saw a World Bank study that, that estimates cities globally need 1.4 trillion worth of infrastructure uh, a year. <laughs> and a, approximately a, a trillion of that is going to be financed by the city themselves. So it, that, that, is, that is one of the fundamental questions for how do we improve cities going forward. Uh, w I, at the same time, we know that there are infrastructure funds out there, that investors are waiting uh, for these projects. But cities have problems getting, for the most part, our, 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 our Rio example excluded, but cities have project, uh, problems getting big infrastructure projects uh, 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 to a fundable stage. And we think there's sort of two key reasons for that. One is that these are sort of once in a career 
projects for city bureaucrats. And so understanding all the mechanisms, how to do it, who the players are, who the various funders are, whether they're private sector, sovereign wealth, uh, pension funds, whoever those funders are, understanding who those players are and putting that uh, deal together is, is something that city uh, bureaucrats don't have the skills necessarily to do. And if that's true, then uh, you know more and more organizations can help this problem by helping cities uh, access technical assistance to, to get these projects uh, over the line. The second is that big infrastructure projects, just to put them together, that the rhythm of that is maybe a 10-year cycle between when we identify the need and we do the various uh, analyses and we get to uh, something that's fundable. And of course, in, in many instances, the political rhythm is much, much shorter. And so you're halfway into this thing and uh, you then have to go back to go uh, and start all over. And so one of the things we're doing is trying to find ways to help cities bridge that gap uh, and access that funding. I would like to add something on that. I mean, I think there's a third factor. I do agree with the two factors you said. There's a third one. I mean, it's the fact that uh, uh, central governments, I mean, uh, in spite, uh, besides being the same party or not, I mean, I'm not saying that's a political issue, uh, but central governments, uh, they make our life very tough. I mean, if you talk to Susanna, if you talk to me, if you talk to Mayor Macri, I know that he's here, he's here from Buenos Aires. If you talk to the mayor of Medellin, we're all going to say the same. I mean, sometimes the, city, they have the, the cap cities that have the capability of getting loans. This is the case of Rio. I mean, I'll say that our fiscal situation uh, is better than a country's fiscal situation, so we're able to get loans, but uh, the model that was developed in the world and the, the institutions that uh, give loans or finance projects, they mostly depend on central governments. So that make our life uh, a very tough life. So, I mean, in spite of the fact that we need to, to, better, to have better manage, managing of, of projects on, on infrastructure, we do need uh, uh, a straight uh, net between uh, cities and institutions that finance projects. I mean, that's something that's urgent, uh, that's something. And, and, and just another comment, you asked me about the Olympics. Uh, what is the good thing about the Olympics? I mean, it's expensive, uh, people push you a lot, but what is the nice thing about the Olympics, especially in a continent Latin, like Latin America, in a, in a country like Brazil? I mean, we're not very used for, of planning. We're not very used to schedules, dates, deadlines. That's, that's not a very, I'll say that's not a very Brazilian culture. Uh, when you have a big event, uh, I'm not saying about Peru, I know that Peruvians are always on time. But, yeah. <laughs> but uh, the thing is, uh, when you have a big event like the Olympics, it's like, uh, and it has a lot to do with legacy. I mean, forget about the World Cup, let's talk about the Olympics here. Uh, but by the end of the day, it's like you have a certain date that everybody's going to come to your country and you got to a city and you got to deliver what you said you were going to deliver. So that helps a lot on this managing of projects. It helps the private sector come. This, just one final remark, this uh, project of the port area that we have in Rio, uh, we started building this project, this PPP, before winning the Olympic bid. But it, it was amazing. I mean, when we won the Olympic bid, it was supposed to be a 15 year, 20 year project. Uh, when we won the Olympics, it brought so much attraction to the city that it's going to be a five-year project. I mean, all the infrastructure is going to be ready by 16. So uh, the way I see these big events, I mean, cities fight a lot to have all these kind of big events. I know that Mayor uh, Susana beat Santiago in Chile for the Pan American Games. Uh, no, 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 I, I didn't beat him. Yeah, I didn't beat. I mean, it's, it's a big competition between cities. It's a fair competition. Fair competition, but anyway, this is a great opportunity for city to make change. Obviously, sometimes you, you're not going to use these big events for legacy, but if you can make good use, good use of them, it's a good thing. Thank you. Can I make just one more quick point Please. about about funding? So often we hear from mayors, it's very e easy to fund mitigation projects, in other words, projects that reduce carbon emissions. And it's not so easy to fund adaptation or resilience projects. And part of this goes back to this index measuring question, is that we don't have a particularly good way, universally accepted way to measure how 
particular infrastructure enhances a city's resilience. If it did, that would go a long way to creating a sustainable marketplace and that would be a motivating factor for cities and for investors and so on. So one of the things we are doing, there are a number of efforts out there trying to measure resilience but trying to consolidate that into one sort of universally accepted uh, or several universally accepted metrics is I think an, an important part in financing resilient infrastructure. Thank you for that very good observation, Michael, because yes, it is much harder and more challenging to finance resilience building than mitigation. Now, Luis, you are more, I believe, on the mitigation side of things. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've heard about uh, four different elements here that go into the financing models, new business models uh, for financing. Is there anything that you would like to add to that? And if I may tag on uh, an add-on, uh, you mentioned that in your Green Cities Index, it's kind of like a voluntary index where cities opt to be included. Yeah. Uh, how is that going? How, uh, well, what's the receptivity of cities in that respect without going into names? I mean, some of us believe that, that what doesn't get measured doesn't get done. So an index is critically important to move ahead on an agenda of well-being within cities. What's your take on that? Are cities uh, positive with, this, with respect to it? Absolutely, though of course when you're measured, there's always the ups and downs of that. I mean, one city gets rated as the greenest city in a region because we did Latin America, North America, Europe, Asia, and, and Africa and the Middle East as separate regions, assuming that of course the, the problems and the solutions are somewhat different in each of those regions. And what the, the best part of it is the, as I say, the reference of how have other cities in similar circumstances solved the same issue. I'll, I'll give you a simple one, ports, where in one part of the world they decided that the ports were actually creating a lot of CO2 emissions because the, the ships run their diesel engines while they're in port. Instead, put in an electrical connection that allows the ships to turn off their motors, have no pollution, and be able to take down the levels of CO2 emissions significantly. These are simple solutions, but as they're shared, more and more cities can do the same simple solutions and make a big difference. As far as financing, you know, we obviously focus on projects w that are real, that are coming into fruition, but we also have our own financing arm that's, that often will participate. And one thing I haven't seen as much of in Latin America, which I'm used to from the US, is really bond funding of major projects, which seems to be now that uh, the countries are much more financially stable, seems like they ha it has a bigger opportunity in this region too. You forgot to talk about the discount for Lima and Rio. <laughs> Let's talk. <laughs> so you're talking about bond issues. Uh, Mayor Pius talked about that sometimes the federal government gets in the way. And that's the point, that's why we don't exactly. have bond issues. So, so uh, okay. That, that, but just, just let me, me be, be insist on that. I mean, unless, we find, I mean, obviously there's always gonna be the opportunity of private money, I mean, there's, there are areas that you can use concessions, PPPs, whatever, I mean, I'm using that a lot in Rio. Uh, I think there's an interesting thing that Mayor Susanna said, uh, being a mayor, there's no ideology, I mean, we gotta, we gotta get solutions to the everyday problems of the people, so that's why I would say a progress, progressive politician like her gets more private money, because she needs solutions for for the province of Lima. But again, if we don't find a way uh, for some projects to get uh, from the new business model, financial institutions, to get loans to cities, I mean, it's gonna be a tough thing. So we could, I could put bonds, a bond model, uh, to solve much of the problems of Rio, but the federal government and federal laws will not allow me to do that. So this is very bad. And we all face the same problem everywhere. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Pius. Luis, uh, there was a lot of talk about technology in the first session this morning, and Mayor Pius has certainly been an advocate of technology in his administration in terms of even being able to better allocate resources towards investment. What are the neatest things that Siemens is doing, working on from a technological point of view? Take us into your research and development at Siemens 
will all sign non-disclosure agreements here and tell us what is coming up over the horizon. What can we look forward to? Well, what we think is really exciting is the fact that there's so much data out there. Much of that data is used just in a specific way but very little of it is truly integrated for decision making and better use of resources. And we have major efforts underway to take that, I'll call it detailed data that we collect all over the place and actually put it into solution-based uh, decisions. Now that goes from, from being in the digital world able to create products and manufacture them and adjust them and change them and do that all digitally, which saves more than 40% and higher than that in the cost of actually going to production and in changing production. That's on, a, on a, in an individual level. But then you can take that data that you're collecting in a factory, for example, and use that to make better decisions about how to run the factory. The same thing can be done at a city level whether it's the water system, which I talked about in Sao Paulo, where we're monitoring the water pumps, the reservoirs, the use, so that very little of the water is, is wasted, and water is a critical resource. Or a fast traffic lane we've built in Saudi Arabia, in Arabia where over 30,000 people registered in the first six weeks, and we guarantee 70 kilometer uh, per hour speed on that lane, and if there's three people in a car, they're on for free. Others are charged and automatically billed to their to their house or to their credit card, and adjusted as the traffic changes. Or the traffic system in London, which adjusts again the the lights and the where to go to park and the cost of downtown traffic depending on the situation. So I think the real future is in data, whether it's your city data center or the city data center we have in uh, the country data center we have in Dubai for any security risks, where not only is there a monitoring and CC cameras, but also GPS and navigation systems so that things are responded to, security issues are responded to immediately. I think that's the future. Thank you, Louise. How do you use that in resilience creating? Yeah, I think it's really interesting. So I was struck by this commitment that Chelsea Clinton announced just before we came on about this dengue fever um, sort of crowdsourcing of information, where the water uh, is collecting uh, so that uh, 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 mosquito eradication programs can address that. And I know, Mayor Pius, in, in your operations center, I, I, I've heard that I'm going to see it on Wednesday, I think. But we use Twitter. You use and ways, right? This ways Twitter, crowdsourcing yeah. information. How do you understand the health of the city by what people are saying about it, and how do you harness that in a more effective way? That's, I think, going to be the real cutting edge of, of, of what we do in Resilience. And there's this issue of collaboration, because uh, like Waze, I mean, we would spend lots of money uh, with companies like Siemens, I love them, uh, uh, buying new, new technology. Then suddenly, I mean, everyone is wearing a smartphone, and everyone is reporting to city responsibles. I mean, they're reporting to themselves, but then you, if you are a city, a city official, you just go, go there and get that information. I mean, we're buying cameras, we're using lots of technology, but by the end of the day, I mean, technology allows people to help you manage the city. Mm -hmm. So this operation center that we have in Rio, we use Twitter to find dengue fever. I mean, uh, we have patterns that shows that in two weeks advance, uh, some, some Twitter messages might show you that's going to be a big thing with uh, dengue fever in a certain region of the city. In ways, works a lot with traffic. Fantastic. You wanted to say something, Senor Alcaldesa. A lot of things. A lot of things. Uh, we only have two minutes left. Two minutes. No, less, less than two minutes. First, funding is uh, very important. Uh, we are trying to, to get uh, from the soil the plus valia uh, through... Uh, local uh, laws and we need to share the best practices on that. Sao Paulo, for instance, has a lot of uh, very important practices for, uh, and, and we need to, to, to share with them. Already we have sharing with them that because we have uh, a very small budget, a very solid economy but a small budget for public investment. 
We need private investment, but we need to build a city for all, not a city for a few people. And the investment must have an impact, a real impact, on all the people, and we live in inequalities that we cannot afford anymore. It is unbearable in our city. If you're born in one part of the city, you have opportunities. If you're born in other part of the city, you will not have the same opportunities and the same, the same human development. Sorry for my English is awful, but I am trying to go, uh, to go with you. So, um, it is very, very important uh, to face uh, the problem of how we build a city with citizens with rights and responsibilities. So I am talking about the culture, uh, again, a political culture, a culture of exchange, of consultation, of dialogue. And it uh, go, um, goes uh, to politics. We cannot avoid politics. It is not a relationship between the private and uh, the local government. It, also, it is also a problem with how we deal with the, the politics as a path mm -hmm. to get into agreements of long terms and sustainability. Uh, because if uh, we don't do that, we will have um, an instability always, corruption, unpredictable uh, situations in the future. And we will not have investment, okay? If Mayor of Lima were, were revoked, this would be impossible. Impossible. Muchas gracias. It's politics. You see? Well, Mayor Villaran, thank you so much for your closing comments that bring, of course, the fundamental importance of values to the conversation. You've mentioned culture. And that yes. is very much a part of our development and of what we want to see in the cities of today and of tomorrow. And with this, amigas y amigos, ladies and gentlemen, we come to the close of this plenary session. Please continue to recharge your personal batteries throughout today and tomorrow so that you can go and do battle in the world for this planet to be a better place. And please, Join me in thanking Michael, Luis, Eduardo, and Susana for a very interesting conversation. <laughs>